Let's read the beginning of Psalm 141, a Psalm of David. Lord, I cry out to you, make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Can you hear the desperation in David's words? The man is desperate. He absolutely needed God to draw close to him. He needed to commune with God. He needed his maker to come close and to help him. That's what he felt. He needed it. That's the, that's the beginning of wisdom. To realize you can't do it on your own. Autonomy, self-sufficiency, these are grave moral evils. To think that we can walk strong in a morally upright fashion without any help from God is foolish in the extreme. And David knew that he was in desperate need of God's help moment by moment. He said, God, come and commune with me and give me help. But David had a problem, a big problem. You see, in Old Testament times, drawing close to God meant being in proximity to the tabernacle temple programs. You had to be in proximity to those precincts, and you had to observe all the prescribed programs, ordinances, and rituals. You know, in the, in the days of Jesus, in the first century in Israel, there were synagogues all over the place. And you know what you didn't do in the synagogue? You didn't pray in the synagogue. The synagogue was used for all kinds of things, for Torah reading, for lodging strangers, for all kinds of things, but prayer was not one of them. If you wanted to pray and commune with God, you know where you went? To the temple. And you better bring a blood sacrifice with you. See? That's why Jesus was so offensive to people when he declared to a healed man, your sins are forgiven you, son. The Pharisees said, who is this man that blasphemes? Like the, Only God can forgive sin. And of course, his program for doing it was the tabernacle and then the temple. And apparently David was some distance from the tabernacle. And yet he wanted to commune with God. This was a big problem. And in David's words, you can see he's got at least some confidence that maybe, just maybe, God would respond to his genuine heartfelt prayers, even though he was not in proximity to the tabernacle. Maybe God would listen. And this, in spite of his personal flaws and failures and imperfections, David thought, maybe God will respond to a sincere and genuine heart position that is postured to reach out to God in desperation. Maybe God would hear, even though I'm not close to the tabernacle. David was very concerned about this. David was well aware of his personal imperfections and the sins that he had committed. He knew that he had transgressed God's wise moral laws, and David was very concerned. In fact, every sane person should be very concerned about this. Elsewhere, in Psalm 143, David pleaded with God. He said, God... Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. And that's a categorical statement. This is not hyperbole. This is true. This is the truth about every last child of Adam. Intrinsically, on our own, without help from God, we are disasters. We have sin natures and we keep accruing to ourselves sin debt. We just keep on breaking God's wise moral laws, and that's a problem. And Adam, original man Adam, is the fountainhead of that problem. You know, you remember Adam? God created him on day six. His amazing, unique image bearer in the created order, original man Adam, the apex of God's created efforts, man. And he made man upright. Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, God made man upright, but he has sought out many devices. Man was made good. He was innocent. He was pure. But man came into the world with the potentiality built into him to do evil. He had free will. He could make a real choice to love, honor, serve God or not. And man deliberately, knowingly, and intentionally transgressed the known will of God. And when he fell in that way, he took us all with him. He represented us. He is our progenitor and federal head, progenitor spiritually and physically. 
and the one who represents us. And Paul actually explains this in great detail in Romans, which is really the constitution of the Christian faith. Romans chapter 5, Paul says that through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. We come into the world with sin debt and sin natures. We're double disasters. And these are big problems that we can't possibly solve on our own. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22, in Adam all die. See, that's a big problem because Adam represents all of us, or he did. You see, this was David's dilemma. He needed God to draw close to him, but please God, not in judgment. Come close to me, but somehow don't see my sin. Because if you see my sin, I'm destroyed on the spot. I'm devastated. I'm, I will be perish in your judgment. See, he needed God to commune with him, but not to destroy him for his past transgressions or the sin that remained in his flesh. And I think that ought to be the thought and the heart position and the deep concern of every sane person on the planet. If you're thinking properly, if we're thinking properly, rationally, morally, we ought to desire God deeply desire God more than anything else to commune with God, the holy God of heaven, because he is the recognized foundation, source, locus, and paradigm of everything that is morally good and upright. Of course we want to commune with that God. And yet we fear God because God will not tolerate sin. And we look at our performance. Look at everything that's gone on in your mind in the last 48 hours, we'll say. Has everything in there been good? Every word out of your mouth, has it been perfect? How about the things we've done? What have we set our attention on? What have we become fixated on? Even for what? Did you forget God? For even a moment, did you forget God that he was Lord and Savior? Did you forget? The patriarch Job was so concerned that his children might for an instant forget God that he was offering sacrifices in case they would transgress against God in that way, to forget him for one moment. How is our performance? How's your thought life? How's your speech? How's your conduct? How's mine? I have to say it's not perfect, but God requires absolute flawless perfection to commune with him. You can see we have a problem here, a big problem. And in Old Testament times, this problem and its blessed solution was prefigured in spectacular visual demonstration by the animal sacrifice programs. In the Old Testament, an animal had to be killed. An innocent animal in the prime of life, not some decrepit thing, something without blemish. It needed to be killed, and the animal's blood needed to be applied in accordance with the prescriptions of the Mosaic Law. It had to happen. And God, if this was done correctly, God would look down from heaven, he would see the animal's perfection, he'd see the animal's innocence, and he would see the faith of the offerer. And this allowed the offerer to draw close to God without immediate judgment against the sins that that man had committed or the sin that remained in his flesh. And in fact, Hebrews 9.13 says that the shedding of innocent animal blood was efficacious to the purifying and sanctifying of the flesh. That animal blood did something in the Old Testament. But you see, now David had a problem. Because David was unable to make sacrifice according to the prescriptions of the Mosaic Law. David was taking this very seriously. So he hoped that God would regard his prayers, his heartfelt prayer, God, will you see that as a sacrifice, please? Let that be instead of the blood sacrifice of the animal. And the lifting up of my hands, maybe, maybe you'll see that as the incense. The prayers, the, the lifting of the hands, what David is, has in mind here, really, is Yom Kippur. It's the holiest day on the Jewish religious calendar. This is where the high priest would go into the holiest chamber of the tabernacle, later the temple, and he would offer atonement for the sins of the nation. It's the holiest day on the calendar. He would have, the high priest would have to kill a bull. He would do it at the brazen altar, the burnt offering, the whole burnt offering. He would take the bull's blood. 
He would take fire from the altar. He would take incense. And he would go into the holiest place in the tabernacle, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, which is the holiest article of furniture in the tabernacle. And it is situated in this innermost chamber, this place recessed from the rest of the tabernacle. It's the place where God's presence was manifest in a unique and spectacular way. In fact, it was terrifying. Nobody dared presume into that chamber except on Yom Kippur and in the way prescribed in the Mosaic Law because if you tried it, you're dead. God says, you approach me on my terms or you don't try it. I will judge you for sins committed and sins, the sinful flesh, the sin that remains in your flesh. And the high priest would go in and he would minister before God in that holy place, the most holy place, with these emblems and elements, the fire, the blood, the incense. And that whole program, I think we talked about this in the past, maybe nine years ago we talked about this. All of that taught us many, many things. One of the things it taught us was the inadequacy of the system itself. And the writer to the Hebrews explores this in the New Testament. He says, why does the high priest have to keep going into that holy place year after year after year? I mean, obviously, this is not a permanent solution to our sin problem. No, it's not. But it's intended to prefigure and point to the one who is the solution to the, to the problem, the sin problem. And that solution is the Son of God himself, the great Melchizedekian high priest, Jesus Christ, whom the ironic high priest prefigured and pointed to. And you can read all about this in Leviticus chapter 16, where the Day of Atonement program is all spelled out in fantastic detail. I mean, just think about it. In Leviticus 16, we're told on the day of Yom Kippur, as part of the ceremony, the high priest had to change his garments. And then you fast forward 1,400 years to the Lord Jesus Christ performing his redemptive work. And what happened to Jesus? The Roman soldiers stripped him of his garments and put a gorgeous robe on him. And they plaited a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. And we remember that the high priest had a turban put on his head. And then they, after they got done mocking Jesus, they stripped him of that gorgeous robe and they put his raiment back on him and led him away to be crucified. The change of garments is even prefigured there by that high priestly service. And that high priest would make intercession for the people. David's thinking about it. With outstretched hands, mind you, intercession for the sinners. Well, of course, Jesus did this actually, not symbolically, really, physically, actually, they stretched out the Lord's arms on that cross beam. They put nails into him. While they're in the middle of doing that, he prays, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now that's the kind of love you don't see on planet Earth. That unconditional, divine, eternal, redemptive love come to maximal expression in the person and work of Jesus, he made intercession for them. Fulfilling Isaiah 53 and 12, he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors, says the prophet, and he bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. In fact, friends, he's still interceding as our faithful and merciful high priest. He's still at the right hand of the majesty on high interceding for us. The beloved disciple John says in his first epistle, chapter 2, he says, Beloved, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now you see right there, he's giving you a little hint that his epistle is not just his opinion. This is God's word. Because David had said elsewhere, Your word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So John thinks what he's putting on paper will help people not sin. Obviously, John knows he's being moved by God to write the things he's writing. But if any man sins, says John, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Jesus is interceding. In fact, the writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 7 and verse 25, 
Jesus ever lives to make intercession for the saints. I love that, friends. When you can't manage words, maybe you're racked with guilt or something this morning, and you can't quite manage words, you have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, the faithful and merciful high priest, who was touched on all points with the feelings of, of infirmity that you feel. The captain of your salvation was made perfect through the things he suffered so that he can sympathize with you and represent you perfectly. This is God taking care of man's deepest needs. Needs that some people don't even know they have. But God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, meeting our deepest needs. It's amazing. And the blood of Jesus Christ accomplishes what David and all like-minded people desperately desire. That is closeness and communion with God without judgment. This is what we really need. And in fact, I'm going to read from the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 10, some of the most powerful and beautiful verses in all the Bible. And I keep coming back to these verses because I love them so much. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Listen, please, to these declarations. Therefore, brethren, having boldness, boldness, to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. We have what David so desperately desired, bold access to communion with God, to commune with God, to, sh to open your heart to God, to share with him things you will share with no one else on planet Earth. Give it all to him. He can handle the problem. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, says Jesus. Bring to Jesus your sins. Bring him your fears, your guilt, your perplexity, your anxiety. Just bring it all to him. Cast your cares upon him, says Peter, for he cares for you. How do you really know he cares for you? Well, there's an empty cross and an empty tomb that says he cares for you very much. And this fulfills really, to some extent, what, what Jesus said to that Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. He said, you know, the woman said, well, we worship at Mount Gerizim over here, and you Jews, you worship in uh, Jerusalem. Jesus said, listen, woman, <laughs> the, the day is coming when you won't wish, worship here or there, but you'll just worship God wherever you are, in spirit and truth. Now, that's the key. Not rote chant prayers without any heart or mind involvement. No. Real, legitimate, heartfelt prayers to God, like David, see? David's desperate. It's coming out in his words. I need you, God. Come close to me and do what you need to do. Make the changes in me that need to be made. Desperate. My favorite prayer in all the Bible is Peter's desperate prayer when he tried to walk on the Sea of Galilee. Do you remember that? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus said, come, Peter. Peter got out of that boat and, of course, obviously, a miracle from God happened there. Peter was able to walk on the water towards the Lord. But he took his eyes off the Lord for just an instant, and he began to sink. And Peter offered what I think is the most heartfelt prayer in all the Bible, perhaps. Lord, save me. <laughs> Three words. Lord, save me. And the Lord saved him. Grabbed him by the hand, brought him back into the boat. This is what God is after. It's genuine. It's real. It's heartfelt. It's, it's absolutely sincere. Whatever words you can muster, or can't, you can just be silent before God. Just let him read your heart. Let him read your mind. Let him, let him see everything it, that you are and everything you need. Let him hear in your, it, reading your mind. Let him see all that you want to confess to him. And trust him, and he will make the changes that need to be made. That's the key here. That's the point. And you can do it wherever you are. I like Zephaniah 2.11, looks ahead to the kingdom age, but we have a partial fulfillment right now. The great prophet here says, people shall worship him, each one 
from his own place, indeed, all the shores of the nations. Yes, even at 618 Muriel in Winnipeg, we can worship God. We're as close to God as you can be. He has chosen to make his temple you, and this despite the sin that abides still in our flesh. One day, body, soul, and spirit, we will be fit for citizenship in a blessed new heavens and earth. But in this dispensation, on this side of heaven, in this pre-mortem run up to heaven, Jesus Christ has made spectacular provision for us in that even with sin abiding in our flesh, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's amazing. No Testament saint ever communed with God in this way. Christ has made special provision for his body and bride. And under God's sovereignty and providential care and concern for the world, you were born at this time, in this place, and you receive God in just the way that he ordained. And you and I, as part of the New Covenant priesthood, we get to be recipients of these marvelous, amazing, mysterious blessings. And the point is, we're not to misuse them. Don't use your freedom as an occasion for the flesh to grant its desires. No. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Put your flesh under subjection and walk a walk worthy of the high call that was placed on you. We might say this, friends, that David desired closeness with God, that he might make request of him. And on the merits of Jesus Christ and what he would do in the future, David got what he wanted. And God was listening. In fact, God was so closely listening to David that God said, I want what you just said, David, in writing. And I'm going to put it in my Bible. That's how closely I'm listening to you right now, David. And I'd like to ask you a question, all, all of you. Maybe I'll ask myself, too. If I really believed I had God's ear, what would I ask him? Sort of like Solomon. God said, ask whatever you want, Solomon. I'll give it to you. You want long life? You want lots of money? You want power, fame? What do you want? It's yours, you name it. What would you do if you really believed God was going to answer your prayer? What would you ask him? It's maybe a little shocking to read what David wrote here. Look at verse 3, please. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity. And do not let me eat of their delicacies. Let the righteous strike me, and it shall be a kindness. Let him rebuke me, and it shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. We just stop there. David had God's ear. He could have anything. David says, God, make me a good man. Is that, is that your cry to God? Make me a good person. Make me someone that you call good in your sight and use whatever means you need to do it, Lord. Even if the righteous have to harshly rebuke me, do it, God. Do what you got to do to make me good. David says, guard my mouth. God, don't let me say stupid, dumb, erroneous, blasphemous things, please. Because Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. By your words, you'll be justified or condemned. So David says, God, watch my mouth. In other words, change my heart. Change my heart and guide my heart. No sinning in anger. No saying things without thought. No fellowship with darkness and no compromise. And God, make me a person who is ready to receive godly counsel and correction. And you know what? David was legit when he prayed that. Because you and I know that David sinned a grievous sin. In fact, David wasn't having a bad day. He was having a bad year. You and I lapse into sin sometimes. A spur-of-the-moment thing. The sins in the flesh take advantage of us. And, and we fall, we stumble, we trip. But David was in a state of willing disobedience for like a year. He, he committed adultery and fraud, deception, and cold-blooded murder. 
And Nathan the prophet approached David and said, You're the man, David. You're the guilty man here. You need to repent. You need to get right with God. You have sinned, a grievous sin, David. Now, David the king could have called for Nathan's execution. He didn't. David was devastated. He was broken. He repented. He mourned for his sin. That's all. We mourn for our sin. Aren't you glad Jesus said, Blessed are they who mourn, they will be comforted. But you've got to mourn for your sin. You've got to hate it. You've got you to have a deep desire to forsake it and be done with it. And Jesus said, You will be comforted. And you know, this heart position, this attitude, it carries right through to the New Testament. Even the great apostle Peter, the spokesman for the apostles, he had walked with Jesus for three and a half years. And in Christ's darkest hour, Peter abandoned him, de denied even knowing the, knowing the Savior. And Peter was devastated by that. And the Lord saw that he was devastated, and the, and the Lord gave him opportunity to be reinstated as an apostle, as a spokesman for the apostles, and he was. You know what Peter did? He fell again. He got led away with hypocrisy, and the apostle Paul had to call him out publicly. This is after Pentecost. Peter is a spirit-indwelt man at this point. He had been filled with the Holy Spirit on numerous occasions. And he tripped up, he fell again. And Paul had to rebuke him harshly in front of others. And Peter had the same heart position as David. And so far from standing against what Paul said, you can read all about this in Acts chapter 15. Compare that with Galatians 2. Peter stood up at the first Jerusalem church council meeting and he basically quoted the rebuke that Saul had given him Paul had given him as though it's true and it's right and it's good and we should we should order our thinking and conduct in accordance with what Paul had said see I wonder if that's our heart position it should be this is good and commendable and right in the eyes of God and in the final book of the Bible the book of Revelation, it's the capstone on a great pyramid of inscripturated revelation. The final book, the book of Revelation. And you are introduced to Jesus Christ as what? The high priest. He appears in chapter 1. He's got the priestly garments on. And he is one who walks among the churches. He's here. We invited him here in the person of the Blessed Holy Spirit, who himself is identified as Christ, he's here, in us, among us. And John saw this in symbolic fashion. He saw the great high priest walking among the candlesticks, which are the churches. He's got seven stars in his hands, the ministers to the churches. He's very, very close to what we're doing, and he knows what's happening around here, the good things and the bad things. And he discloses that. In Revelation 2.23, I'm the one who searches the minds and the hearts, says Jesus, to give to every man according to his works. And the Lord confronts those seven churches. He's got good things to say. He's got bad things to say. He commends them when they're getting things right. He rebukes them when they're getting things wrong. And we have to ask, as we read those two chapters, Revelation 2 and 3, are we willing to be rebuked by the Lord and to be corrected by him? and to be cleansed and to have our feet set on a good path again. Are you willing? It's not fun to be corrected, but it's for our good and for his glory. You know what the Lord says? The Lord says to those who overcome, I have wonderful things promised for you. And you go through the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. He says, overcome cold-heartedness towards me. Overcome fear of death. Overcome compromise. Overcome that Jezebel spirit. Overcome the spirit of autonomy and self-sufficiency. Overcome all these things. And you and I, we will commune together and we'll run the world together one day. I will give you spectacular, amazing, mysterious, special rec recognition, privileges, responsibility, and reward just for overcoming. And you know how to overcome, don't you? Your faith. Your faith, your testimony, 
the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony will overcome this world in all its temptations, trials, roadblocks, barriers, obstacles. The blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony is sufficient for this hour and every hour. That's it, friends. Let's close with a prayer. Let's ask God to seal these things into our hearts and minds. Our dear, blessed, and holy God of heaven, we thank you this morning, Lord, for the word of your grace that's been entrusted to us. We thank you, Lord, for confronting us this morning with powerful things, Lord. Thank you for loving us in spite of ourselves, in spite of the sin that still remains in our flesh. We ask you this morning, God, that you would help your people to overcome whatever obstacles are in the way, preventing us from moving along the road called sanctification, we ask you, God, to help us overcome. Walk with us step by step, God, as we navigate through this life, as we strive to walk in the good works that you've prepared beforehand for us to walk in. We thank you, God, for the grace and favor you have shown this candlestick in this community. We pray, God, you'd continue to hold us together, an unbreakable bond of common faith, and the blessed Holy Spirit who acts as the glue that holds us together and the lubricating agent so that all these moving parts can move together and work together in the best way possible to bring honor and glory to the God who loved us first and to be a genuine blessing to Christ's redeemed. Lord, we commit these great things to your tender care and ministry this morning. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you all, dear saints, and thank you so much.